Section 1. Introduction. We've seen already that elements of z-adjoin root 2 are of the form x plus y root 2 for x and y integers. The norm of the element x plus y root 2 is the number x squared minus 2y squared, and an element u of z-adjoin root 2 is a unit if its norm is plus or minus 1. That is, the set of units of z-adjoin root 2, which I'll denote z root 2 cross, is equal to the set of elements x plus y root 2, where x and y are integers, and x squared minus 2y squared is plus or minus 1. So we need to solve this equation over the integers. Last video, we worked out algebraically what this solution set looked like by passing to logarithm space. It's the set of all numbers of the form plus or minus epsilon to the n, as n ranges over all integers, for some number epsilon. Now, this number is called a fundamental unit, because it can be used to build all the other units in this way. Then I told you that 1 minus root 2 is a fundamental unit, but I didn't really tell you how I came up with this number. How do we find fundamental units in general? Now, a bit of good guesswork was all I needed in this case, and you can sometimes do this when the number under the square root sign is nice. For example, in z root 82, the element x plus y root 82 has norm x squared minus 82y squared, and without too much difficulty you might spot that 9 squared minus 82 times 1 squared equals minus 1, so x equals 9, y equals 1. 9 plus root 82 is a unit. It's also not hard to see that a fundamental unit is one with the smallest possible x value. It's nearest to the origin in log space. So we only need to do a quick check of the cases x equals 1, 2, and so on up to 8 to check that there are no solutions there. And there aren't, so x equals 9, which gives 9 plus root 82, must be the minimal solution. On the other hand, in z root 86, where the element x plus y root 86 has norm x squared minus 86y squared, it's not obvious where to even start finding any units at all. I won't ask you to pause the video and try it for yourself. The fundamental units for this ring are plus or minus 10,405 plus or minus 1,122 root 86. So guesswork doesn't always seem to be a feasible option. In this video, we're going to discuss solutions to the family of equations x squared minus dy squared equals plus or minus 1, where d is a positive integer. That's another way of saying that we're going to find elements x plus y root d in z adjoin root d that are units. Now, for googling purposes, this equation and related equations are often called Pell's equation, even though Pell wasn't the first to do serious work on them. For obvious reasons, I'm going to insist that d isn't a square, that is that root d isn't in z already. And before we move on, here's a simplification that we're going to make throughout. Notice that x plus y root d is a unit if and only if x minus y root d is a unit, if and only if their negatives are units. They all have the same norm, and an element is a unit if its norm is plus or minus 1. So last video, when d was equal to 2, I talked about the unit 1 minus root 2, but I could easily have talked about 1 plus root 2, or minus 1 plus or minus root 2. We have flexibility here to choose whichever plus and minus signs are most convenient for us, and to keep things simple, I'm mostly going to choose to work with plus signs in this video, so x and y will be positive. Section 2. Rational Approximation Fix some positive non-square value of d. We aim to solve the equation x squared minus d times y squared equals plus or minus 1 for positive integers x and y. Dividing this equation by y squared, we get x over y all squared minus d equals plus or minus 1 over y squared. Now we'll get on to how to solve this shortly, but let me start off by taking a very crude approximation. Since y is an integer, this right hand side is probably very close to 0. That means that x over y is approximately equal to the square root of d. So, in looking for units, we're looking for rational numbers x over y that are approximations to root d. But that's quite vague, so let's make it more precise. Suppose this equation holds. How good an approximation must x over y be to root d? And what does that mean? Well, let's take the absolute value of both sides, and factorise the left-hand side as a difference of two squares. So we get mod x over y minus root d 
times mod x over y plus root d equals 1 over y squared. Now, since x over y is approximately root d, this second factor is bounded below by some constant, let's call it c, that's quite close to 2 root d. We'll be a little more precise on that later, but for now let's just call it c. So mod x over y minus root d is at most 1 over c y squared. So we have an upper bound on how good we need our approximation to be. What does this look like in practice? Well, let's take an example. I'm going to take the number pi, and I'm going to see whether I can find rational approximations x over y to pi, so x and y are positive integers, such that this difference is bounded above by 1 over cy squared. And for now, for the sake of simplicity, let's just assume c equals 1. Okay, well, the number 3.14 is a rational approximation to pi. So does mod pi minus 3.14 satisfy this bound? As a fraction, 3.14 is 157 over 50. So y equals 50. And we're asking for the distance between pi and its approximation to be at most 1 over y squared, which is 1 over 2,500. But mod pi minus 3.14 is almost 4 over 2,500 if you calculate it. So this approximation isn't good enough, it falls short by a factor of 4. Okay, then let's take a closer approximation, 3.141. As a fraction, this is 3,141 over 1,000. So y equals 1,000, and we're asking for the distance between pi and this approximation to be at most 1 over y squared, which is 1 over a million. But mod pi minus 3.141 is more than 592 over a million suddenly it falls short by a factor of almost 600. Now why did our approximation get worse even when we got closer to pi? The problem is that the bound on the right hand side, 1 over y squared, depends on the denominator y. As the denominator increases, the allowed deviation from the true value decreases even faster. And intuitively this means we want to get close to the true value of pi, but we care more about doing it efficiently with respect to the denominators, so as efficiently as possible in the sense of using values for x and y that are as small as possible. Okay, so let's try some small denominators. When y equals 1, our best approximation to pi is 3 over 1, and that does satisfy this bound. When y equals 2, we get 6 over 2, but that doesn't work. When y equals 3, we get 9 over 3, which doesn't work. And we can keep trying a few more denominators. The next one to work is y equals 7. The closest approximation there is 22 over 7. But trial and error is slow. The next approximation that works is 333 over 106. Pretty soon these denominators get out of control. So how could we work this out faster? Well, let's start with our first approximation. Pi is approximately 3. Here, x is 3 and y is 1. Notice that, as we hoped, pi minus 3 is indeed less than 1 over y squared, which is just 1. In other words, pi is somewhere between 3 minus 1 and 3 plus 1. But we can do much better than that. Pi minus 3, which is 0.14159 and so on, is between an eighth and a seventh, which means that pi is between 3 and an eighth and 3 and a seventh. Now, you might be able to spot how we get 22 over 7 out of this. The right-hand side of this inequality is 22 over 7. So subtracting it from all sides of this inequality, we get an 8th minus a 7th is less than pi minus 22 over 7, which is less than 0. Tidying this up, pi minus 22 over 7 is sandwiched between minus 1 over 8 times 7 and 0. So this definitely implies that the absolute value of pi minus 22 over 7 is less than 1 over 7 squared. The key to this inequality was bounding pi between 3 and an eighth and 3 and a seventh, so can we repeat this somehow? Let's go back to the start. We know that pi lies between two integers, 3 and 4. Let a0 be the smaller of these, 3, and let's write pi equals 3 plus epsilon 0. So epsilon is going to denote some small error between 0 and 1, and I've labelled them a0 and epsilon 0 because this is the zeroth stage of our approximation. Now our next step was to bound epsilon 0 between two neighbouring fractions with numerator 1. 
That's the same thing as bounding 1 over epsilon 0 between some integer a1 and the next. a1 turned out to be 7, so we determined that pi, which is 3 plus epsilon 0, is equal to 3 plus 1 over 7 and a bit. I'll call that extra little bit, that error term, epsilon 1. This gave us bounds on pi, and the fraction here with the smaller denominator gave us our next approximation, 22 over 7 which we then showed was precise enough. Now let's just repeat the process. Can we write epsilon 1 as 1 over some integer, a2, plus some small error term epsilon 2? Yes, all we need to do is bound 1 over epsilon 1 between two integers. Well, 1 over epsilon 1 is 15.9 and a bit, meaning that a2 is 15 with this error term epsilon 2. As before, this gives us bounds on pi, and this fraction involving 15 is the approximation we want. This fraction simplifies to 333 over 106, as I promised earlier. Let's just quickly check it's precise enough. If we subtract it from all sides of this inequality, and we get 0 is less than pi minus it, which is less than this difference here. But a bit of work to simplify these fractions later, and all the nested fractions cancel each other out, leaving something obviously smaller than 1 over 106 squared. Let's do a couple more. The reciprocal of epsilon 2 is 1 and a bit, so a3 is 1 with some error term epsilon 3, and this gives an approximation of 355 over 113. Now the reciprocal of epsilon 3 is 292 and a bit, so a4 is 292 with some error term epsilon 4. This gives an approximation of 103,993 over 33,102. Section 3. Continued fractions. The expression for pi that we're deriving is called its continued fraction. It's a little unwieldy, so we're going to give it the following standard notation using these square brackets. Notice that the dots here mean that this is an infinite continued fraction. I can write its approximations as finite continued fractions. For example, its truncation after the first three entries, 3, 7, 15, means 3 plus 1 over 7 plus 1 over 15. All right, these numbers, which we called ai, are called the partial denominators. Notice that I'm using a semicolon to separate off the first value, 3, and commas for all the rest. That's because 3 is the integer part, and it's not really a denominator of anything but they're called partial denominators. And if we truncate this continued fraction at any point, we just get one of the rational approximations we saw before. These approximations are called convergence, and it's often helpful to give these as a sequence of numerators and denominators in their simplest form. I'll call them Pn and Qn. Here's a table of the partial denominators and convergence to pi. If you follow the earlier method closely, you might be able to write down recurrence relations for Pn and Qn in terms of An. They're as follows. P0 is A0, P1 is A1 A0 plus 1, and for n greater than 1 we have Pn is An Pn minus 1 plus Pn minus 2. And similarly for Q, Q0 is 1, Q1 is A1, and Qn is a n q n minus 1 plus q n minus 2. This is true for any continued fraction. As an example, let's see if we can calculate the continued fraction with partial denominators 1, 1, 1, 1, and so on. I'll give this number a name, phi, and here's a table of those partial denominators. They're all just 1. Now, substituting these into the recurrence relations we had before, we see that those recurrence relations defining its convergence both just become the recurrence relations for the Fibonacci sequence, offset from each other by 1. Now you might happen to know that the quotients of successive Fibonacci numbers converge to a number called the golden ratio, that is, phi equals 1 plus root 5 over 2. But if you don't know that, consider the following elementary argument. The continued fraction expansion of phi is repeating, so we can replace the denominator of the first fraction by phi again to get a quadratic equation which gives us this solution. Now, there's a huge theory of continued fractions and generalizations of them, 
mostly stemming from that inequality we saw at the start and these recurrence relations. The continued fraction of a real number gives us a sequence of best rational approximations to it, where best is used in some precise sense here to talk about efficiency with respect to growth of the denominator. But I'll avoid the temptation to fall down this rabbit hole, and I'll just talk about what we're interested in. Section 4. Rational Approximations to Root D Here, as before, D is a positive integer that is not a square. We've already seen that if x squared minus dy squared is plus or minus 1, then x over y is some kind of good approximation to root d, in the sense that mod x over y minus root d is at most 1 over cy squared for some constant c. Now to link this to what we've just seen about continued fractions, we're going to need to take a closer look at that constant c. Remember that we had mod x over y all squared minus d equals 1 over y squared, and so mod x over y minus root d times mod x over y plus root d equals 1 over y squared. Let's exclude the trivial case where d equals 1. Then root d is always greater than 1, and so any half-decent approximation x over y to root d will also be at least 1. And so we can bound this factor below by 2, which means that we can take c equals 2, that is, mod x over y minus root d is less than or equal to 1 over 2y squared. That's not a big improvement, but it is an important difference. We're trying to relate convergence x over y to root d with solutions to Pell's equation x squared minus dy squared equals plus or minus 1. Now, all convergence satisfy this bound for c equals 1, and all solutions to Pell's equation satisfy this bound for c equals 1, but neither of these implications is reversible, so we don't have a clear path between convergence and solutions. But solutions to Pell's equation also satisfy this stronger bound for c equals 2. Is it possible that this stronger bound will help? Well, the details of this proof aren't difficult, but they are long, so I'll omit them here. But using the recurrence relations shown earlier, it's possible to show that any fraction satisfying this bound is a convergent to root d. Now, finally, we have a clear path of implications. Not all convergence of solutions to Pell's equation, but all solutions to Pell's equation are found in our list of convergence. So we just have to perform a small search. And remember that once we've found the smallest one, we can generate all the others from it. But we can say more. Let's calculate some continued fractions and see what actually happens in practice. Running the earlier continued fraction algorithm for root d for several positive integers d, we get root 2 is 1, 2, 2, 2, 2, and so on. Root 3 is 1, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, and so on. Root 5 is 2, 4, 4, 4, 4, and so on. Now, these are all looking suspiciously nice, so here are some slightly nastier examples. Root 7 is 2, 1, 1, 1, 4, 1, 1, 1, 4, 1, 1, 1, and so on. Root 29 is... 5, 2, 1, 1, 2, 10, 2, 1, 1, 2, 10, 2, 1, 1, 2, and so on. Root 86 is 9, 3, 1, 1, 1, 8, 1, 1, 1, 3. 18, 3, 1, 1, 1, 8, 1, 1, 1, 3. 18, 3, 1, 1, 1, 8, 1, 1, 1, 3, and so on. Notice that they're all periodic. Root 2 has period 1, root 3 has period 2, and so on. And for each of those with period m, I'm going to highlight the first m values in blue and the next m values in yellow. Notice that the yellow section repeats, and the blue section is the same as the yellow section apart from that first entry. Now, perhaps it's no surprise that we got a repeating pattern. After all, we saw that substituting the continued fraction of phi, that is 1, 1, 1, 1, and so on, into itself, we got a quadratic equation. And all of these numbers are just square roots as well. If you calculate the convergence and check where the minimal solution to Pell's equation occurs, you'll find some more patterns occurring. So here are a few examples. Let's take root 2 as an example. Here are the partial denominators. Here the period m equals 1. Here are the convergence pn over qn. And in this row, I'm going to calculate pn squared minus 2qn squared. 
So I want to know whether this is equal to plus or minus 1 at any of these values n. We can see that the first solution occurs at n equals 0, and it gives us x squared minus 2y squared equals minus 1. Root 3. Here, m equals 2. The first solution occurs at n equals 1, and it gives us x squared minus 3y squared equals plus 1. Root 29. Here, m equals 5. The first solution occurs at n equals 4, and it gives us x squared minus 29y squared equals minus 1. And root 86. Here, m is 10, and the first solution occurs at n equals 9. It's the solution I told you about in the introduction. And it gives us x squared minus 86y squared equals plus 1. So hopefully you can spot a pattern. And it turns out, after a little more fiddling with bounds and recurrence relations, you can prove that the first solution to x squared minus dy squared equals plus or minus 1 always occurs when n equals m minus 1, where m is the period. And that solution is a minus 1 if m is odd, and a plus 1 if m is even. Section 5. Units. We've now completely solved Pell's equation. In particular, this gives us all of the units of zeta-join root d. We find the continued fraction of root d, we find its period m, we look for the m minus 1th convergence, say p over q, and then all units in zeta-join root d are of the form plus or minus p plus or minus q root d to the power n, as n ranges over all the integers. In practice, we often want to look at slight enlargements of zeta-join root d. We've seen this already, although it was slightly hidden. Rather than zeta-join root minus 3, we always considered zeta-join 1 plus root minus 3 over 2, a slight enlargement. Except we called this ring z omega, where omega is e to the 2 pi i over 3, a complex cube root of unity. We're going to do the same thing here. Instead of considering zeta join root 5, we'll usually consider the slightly larger ring zeta join 1 plus root 5 over 2. Its technical properties are much nicer, both of these rings on the right are integrally closed. Of course, in practice, this may leave us with a bit more searching to do to find all the units, but we've more or less reduced the problem to a small search. The fundamental unit inside zeta join root 5 is 2 plus root 5, so this gives us some unit inside the larger ring z to join 1 plus root 5 over 2. This unit, 2 plus root 5, may still be the fundamental unit inside the larger ring, or it may be a positive power of the fundamental unit. In fact, it turns out to be the cube of the element 1 plus root 5 over 2 itself, which is the fundamental unit in this ring. But notice also that our method was very specific to real quadratic extensions. Calculating the units of other number rings, for example cubic extensions, is in general still very hard. For most rings this is usually an open problem. Next video, we'll see an application of Pell's equation of a completely different kind.